So hi everyone, I'm very excited to be here. We are going to talk today about two interesting domains, personalization and gaming. My name is Noga Attar and I'm an AI product manager in Platica. So our belief in Platica is that it's all about the game experience and game experience required personalization. We aim to provide to each player the best game experience exactly for him. So let's understand what is Platica. If I need to play. Since the day we are born, we all need play. Through play, we learn. We explore. We stimulate our senses or we let go. We connect with others or connect with ourselves. While the need for play is universal, what people play and how people play is an individual choice. And at Platika, our mission is to entertain the world through infinite ways to play. By smashing art with science, we create the most vibrant and eclectic mix of games, and we do it all with an endless passion. We dare to challenge, and we'll play to change the game. We are coders and marketers that run with the pack, artists and data scientists that make it count, storytellers and strategists that cut to the chase. We are Pratika. Bringing you infinite ways to play. Pratika. So because life needs play, our vision is to excite each and every one of our players like the game was made just for him. This is our secret sauce since we launched the first game until now as leaders in the industry. Therefore, we need to understand if you love to explore, if you love to socialize, or maybe your motivation is basically to break your own records. And then we can give you the best experience for you, you would think. But it's good and it's not enough. Because as an explorer, you would also like to play with others, but on top of it, you would like to break your record and compete against others. So in other words, we aim to provide the best game experience, but also in the right context to each player. So as you can understand, and I believe all of you already know it, personalization is complex. Behind the scenes, it's required a lot of professionals to create, to execute, and to analyze game experience for each and every one of our players. And this is only in one game. Now let's take this complexity to 14 games, nine of them in the top 100 of the United States, each game with this different game experience and different genres. From our Bingo Blitz, when you can explore islands, to designers that are looking for innovative idea in our Reader Core application. And all of that with high quality of content and 24 seven operation. And this is our challenge, and this is what we are going to dive into today. How we can enable personalization in an easy way, easy to execute way, to all our games in an easy way. Our approach is to keep all the drama under the hood, to keep all the complexity of the AI and all the algorithms ap apart from our players, apart from our game users. Basically, what we are doing is to provide end-to-end -end digital products that empowered, um, empowers our game users by providing them best knowledge and best practices on how to do their day-to-day -day job. All of that with learning from their expertise and constantly improving by their feedbacks. So I believe the question will be, how are we doing it? What is the process and how we achieve this goal? So now I'm going to dive into some use cases some of the product that we use in Platica and explain the models behind them and the process that we've done. Okay, so in practice, we divide the personalization process into two parts. The first part is identifying the personas. Identify the personas that for some reason, I want to treat them together as a whole. And the second part is how to costume, how to choose the ideal, game, the ideal game experience for them. So we are behind each of every step, so we have a few algorithms and few products that we've built that we are now going to dive into and understand them better. 
So let's start from the left side, from identifying the persona. Here I chose to focus on two main products in order to explain what we did. So the first one is the multi-dimensional division product that based on the preferences of our players, know to divide them in the best way possible today. We are not talking about one or two preferences. We're talking about a lot of them, hundreds of them. And in real time, you can tell me what is the best groups and what is the best division to do in the game. And the second product is an AI engine that we build that knows how to predict based on these multidimensional preferences of the players, what they are going to do, not only today, not what they are going to love today, but in the future, tomorrow, or one week from now. In this product, if I want to know who out of my player is going to launch, to love a, a feature that I'm going to launch, I can try to predict it. Or if I want to know who out of my player is going to churn the game, I can try and predict it. And if on the left side, we are talking about algorithms like KMIS, on the right side, we are talking about more advanced algorithms like XGBoost, LTSM, or survival models, because we are not only interested in whether or not a player is going to churn the game, I also want to know when exactly in time is it going to happen. So now that we understood the first part of identifying the personas, let's dive and understand how we choose the ideal game experience for each of them. So we've built a product that knows how to provide the best game experience to each group in real time. This product is based on few algorithms from the multi-arm bandit family. Basically, what is happening behind the scenes is that the models provide to each group the best experience that he knows or, uh, or believe that, will, that, will like, that they will like the most. And based on that, he, uh, he get the feedbacks from the players, get the reaction, how they react to this experience, and automatically keep on turning, they keep on adjusting the best experience to know better tomorrow. As I said, we have few algorithms in this process. So for example, we will use the stochastic multi-arm bandit in cases when we don't have any historical data, and we will start like a cold start or a reinforcement learning to understand what my players like the most. And if I do have the context, I will, do, I will use the contextual multi-arm bandit in order to use the knowledge that I have, use the historical data from one month ago, two months ago, and use this knowledge in order to provide the best experience for them. Basically to segment the right personalization for each one. So to summarize this part up, we say that with one AI engine, we identify the personas and identify the group that I want to treat. And with the second one, we choose the ideal, uh, ideal game experience for them. We fit them in the perfect way possible. It is also important to mention that in this process, we always use another tool that we build to do A-B tests based on other AI algorithms in order to make sure that we are always uh, focusing on the business KPIs because we want to make sure that we are aiming to the goal and we're achieving the goal that we started from. And another thing that it's worth to mention, and I will talk about it later on in the presentation, is that we want to make sure that our, play, that our users, the game users, the monetization manager or operation manager, understand what we are doing. They understand what the model is doing and not treat it as a, back, as a black box. Because we want to gain their trust. We are going to change things in the game. We are going to affect their players. And we want to make sure that with one unit, we work together and trust everything that we are doing. So now that we understood the product and the processes that we have, let's focus on the AI challenges. Let's understand all this process from the AI side and, and try to tackle it from this angle. For this, I chose to focus on our prediction engine and understand how this product and process was done. So just before that, I'm going to do a short recap on how to, to use and create a prediction models for those of you who are less familiar with. So the first thing that I want to do when creating a prediction model is to define the label. Define the label that for some reason I want to understand in the data. What is the data that I want to understand? For example, let's say that we want to predict who out of my player is going to become a churner. In order to do so, I need to understand the data and understand who is a churner. So from my perspective, a channel is someone that didn't log into the game for 14 days and above. And when do I want to know it? At least 14 days before. Because if he's not going to be happy in 14 days from now, 
I want to know it today so I can change his experience and make sure he will get the ideal one for him. After defining the label, I need to start exploring the data, understand the data, and create the features. Create the features that for me is a feature for, for someone that's churned. And from now on, I will create a model that based on the correlation between someone that already churned to my, to my label, will get into a decision tree that I will make, and each one will get a score between zero to one whether this player is going to become a churner. And based on this number, I can know how to treat them accordingly in the game. And on top of it, we will wrap everything with AI monitoring in order to make sure that we are always on top of the data, that we don't have any concept drift or data drift, because a model that I've created today might not be relevant in six months from now. So we always want to be on top of that. Now, basically, I described here in few sentences work of few months of data engineers and data scientists and a lot of other roles in the process. And as you might understand up until now, it's not as easy as it sounds. Now, it brings me to the dilemma that we have when develop the product in Platica. Where in the scale from professional service to fully automated solution, we want to be with our users. Because if I will look at the left side of professional service, I can go to my data scientist and ask them to create for me a prediction model. And it will be a relatively easy task. What they will do is that they will understand the business question, they will explore the data, they will create the model, run it on their own, and even monitoring by themselves in a manual way. It will have great performance and the time to market will be relatively good. The problem starts when I want to start and create another use case, and I want to have another studio to have this prediction model. Here, they will need to invest the same amount of effort that they invest in the first one, also in the second use case and the second, on, the, on the second studio. And it can take a lot of time, and this is exactly not the place where you want to be when building the prediction engine. It's not scalable and it's not stabilized, because the monitoring is manually. And if we will look at the other side of the scale, the fully automated solution, here we are talking about simple UI that provide our users the ability to choose any label that they want, create any model that they want, run it by themselves, train it by themselves, and push it in production. In order to do so, we need heavy infrastructure and very self-educating UI with heavy algorithms behind the scenes. It can take years to get, it, to, get to this point. And in Platica, we like to run fast. We cannot wait years in order to get a prediction engine. So in the end, for those many reasons, we decided to create a product that is more leaning toward the right side, toward a fully automated solution. But instead of providing our user the ability to create on their own the label and train by themselves the model, we provide them a list, a catalog of models that they can use in order to choose what they want to predict now what they want to use, what is their business question. And we also present them the question of a threshold optimization. Do you want to optimize on a recall or do you want to optimize on precision? But we are not using this term. We are using it in a language of a user that is not familiar with, uh, with data science, that is not an AI user. So he can choose from his business perspective what he wants to do, because basically it's not an AI, it's not, not an AI question. It's a business question, and they need to answer it in the best way possible. It's important to say that in order to get to this point, we needed to create the foundation and understand what is the similarities between the different games. As I said in the beginning, we have a lot of games in Platica. And in order to have the ability to provide one UI and one simple or one catalog of models for all of them, we need to understand what is the similarities between them. So in order to do that, we build a player taxonomy and established a game abstraction to make sure that we build one foundation with all the similarities between the different games and provide them the ability to use the same models. And basically, this is how we uh, used our, and he, this is how we hid all the drama under the hood, provide our users end-to-end -end solution with basic UI, simple UI that enable them to do all the things that they want, predict anything that they want, in a simple way. And to be honest, I can talk about personalization for hours. But I want to summarize three takeaways from this presentation for you to understand what you can take from here. So the first thing is about the game experience. 
The game experience is the key. And the, the minute you understand it, you have endless possibility. As a player, I don't care about all the others that are playing the game. I care about my own journey. And the minute you will provide the best game experience for him, you win the game. The second one is from the game team, from our, uh, from our team in Platica. Always hid, the answer is very simple. Always hid and hide all the complex of AI under the hood and all the drama. Give them to interact with the, with the game, with the, uh, with the product, like there is no AI inside. But always remember to keep them in the loop because it's important that we will understand that they trust the product. And last but not least, from the AI side, the better you build the foundation, in this case, the game abstraction, the easiest it will be for you to scale. AI is very sensitive for scaling. And when you manage to scale it and create your use cases, you win it. And we like to win the game. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, maybe? Yeah. You have a microphone? Um, thank you for that. That's very interesting. Um, so how do you then actually integrate um, these custom these personalizations? How do you react? For example, you're, you're predicting churn for your players and you want to then uh, retain them somehow. How are you actually... Uh, reacting to that how are you doing this personalization for the players so that they stay interested then or whatever your reaction then is so is it working you hear me put it okay so basically it's it takes to the second part of what i discussed in the beginning how we choose the ideal game experience so when we are using prediction model instead of understanding the segments today and the groups of players today i understand them for let's say one month from now or two weeks from now and then I will take these groups that the model told me that they are going to churn or any other uh, treatment that I choose, and I will give them the best experience that I can from uh, with using our second part, using the model that tells how to give the best experience to the players. Okay, so basically you predictively create content for the players so because you know in 14 days they might churn, so you're creating content that will hopefully engage them by that so, time. So we have two options. The first one is to create protocols for players that we know that are going to churn. And then the minute they will do it, we will give them any experience for churned players. But if I want to, uh, to treat them before and make sure they will not churn, I need to create now the experience, not in the future, from today, like let's say seven days from now, give them another protocol of about to churn player and make sure that I save them in the game. And then we look between our uh, test group to the actual group that take this protocol and understand if they actually churned or not and see the differences between them. And what are these protocols, for example? Is that like, I don't know, a, a sudden special deal on some... It can be a lot of things from, from game experience to deals that we will show them for new features. Maybe we'll give them sneak tip, sneak peek of a feature that is not leaked yet so they can try it before and see like they're special. We have a lot of things to do in order to make sure our player is entertained and get what he wants. And even if we are not doing what I just said, we can just provide them the ability and provide them what they like. If, there someone, if you're someone that likes to play with others, we will give you features to combine with your friends and give gifts from your friends, for example. We have a lot of options how to tackle it. Okay, thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Like a race. It was him. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you showed like the first uh, video in the beginning, you know about the like general understanding of video games and their importance in our life, um, and then you give this presentation, and afterwards I have like one, maybe a difficult question, but uh, like. The products and the principles you offer, they kind of border on the line of what is ethical and what is not, even if it's not like, you know, a personal approach or like spying to, to produce experience, but maybe build on cohorts and anyway, yeah, and some other ways. But um, how do you disseminate? Because on the one hand, you can use the technology, right, to like, especially give the best possible experience for the player. On the other hand, you can use the same technology just to kind of make your own monetization 
much more effective. So, uh, and in your presentation, there is nothing about, you know, ethics. Do you have those internal conversations, you know, and how they go? I, I will say in general that, yes, it's something that is always on the table. I can say that we are not spying, as you say, our, about our players. It's not like, I don't know, Facebook or Instagram that you feel it, that you see a, uh, an ad according to it. We look only about the data that you have in the game. If you play something more, then we know that you liked it. If you didn't log in, we know that you uh, some, probably didn't like something that we did before. So we use only the things that you do in the game in order to understand how you like to play so we can give you what you need. This is basically what we are doing. But the ethic is also always on the table. Yeah, but uh, what I meant more like not from how you gather data because that is kind of supervised by laws in many countries, though the ways are limited. But by the way, you choose how to apply your technology and your knowledge, you know, in order to achieve the goal, whether it's to, yes, uh, focus on the player experience or rather, you know, focus on, you know, just how to get more out of him, whether it's his time or whether it's his money and uh, whether you, you know, outsource this technology or use, use it internally, you know, how, how often like the ethical point is, you know, what we do and what we don't. Do you have those rules inside of your company? No, so I, in, I, I will not get into all the details, but in every company, not only in Playtica, we are, they have a law of what you can do and what you cannot do and what is head, ethic and what is not. We have people that managing it in Playtica. So you can make sure that we are not uh, doing something that is not ethic even without them. We are really on top of doing what is best for our players to entertain them for their own good. Thank you. One last question, I think. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, is there any kind of um, player interview in the process of creating the personas that you mentioned in the very beginning? Because I didn't really see how... Uh, there was, like, I didn't see how you can kind of start with a persona and then, you know, tailor to that persona. So was there a player interview? Was there some other metric that was going on and creating that? So in general, it's two different topics. We do a player's interview all the time for specific feature to understand if they love what they see and if they don't. We have a lot of players that really engage with us and we make sure to do it. But this is not related to the personalization process that I showed because we are looking um, on a group of people and not on a one persona. In the end, we have millions of players in each and our game and we cannot get to each one of them. So based on their habits and how they play, we know how to start, like, as I said, reinforcement learning, a cold start, and from there to improve ourselves. So the first experience might not be the best one, but according to the feedbacks and how we will see that our players are reacting to it, we will know how to make it better. Thank you. And then as a follow-up to that, uh, how often do you, like, I guess, like, how many interviews do you start to get the feeling like, okay, this is a persona? Um, I can't really tell you the number, but I can say that we have group in Platica that doing interviews for all our games on, let's say, weekly basis with several players regarding different games, different features. Uh, we launched, for example, a web store that you can buy outside of the store. So we wanted to make sure if it's something that our players even want. So we have a lot of interviews regarding the feature that we are going to launch. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have more time for one more question? I think yes. Do we have one more question? Yeah. Hi, hi, Alec. I think probably it will be a couple of, couple of connected questions. Number one is like for, uh, of course, for the political like company where you already have like so many products and matured products. It all makes sense. At what point would you suggest to introduce the personalization for a new product, like in the life cycle? Like when should the developers consider, okay, now we are already in the zone, we need to start personalization right from the beginning or after having some substantial amount of users? So from our side, is right from the beginning. I will say that we started this process from day one in Platica. And of course, we are now improving everything with all the AI capabilities that we have and make it better also for new studios or new game that might come to use it from day one. Uh, so it's not really a question of whether or not to start. It just start it whatever, whenever you can and you have the ability to do so. And based on your experience, uh, how much is the difference or how much is the impact you would basically put with personalization and without personalization? So it, it really depends on the use case and the studio and everything. 
but we did a lot of tests in the beginning and I can see that we saw almost almost 40% difference for 40. zero, yes, between oh. personalization process and not personalization. Because when you do one experience, only one group will enjoy it, not all the groups. And we want to make sure that all our groups, all our uh, personas in the game will enjoy uh, the process. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. Any?